Hi, my name is Drew Patterson. I'm the general manager of treetime.ca and we ship millions of seedlings from coast to coast across Canada uh, with primarily native species. And I'm gonna be talking about shelter belts today. Why shelter belts? Ultimately, the answer is all about quality of life. You, whether you are in a very windy spot or you're in a spot that doesn't get a, a lot of water or you're in a spot that uh, some of your plants are having trouble surviving, uh, shelter belts are the answer. They can solve a lot of those problems. Uh, we see a lot of field shelter belts to help keep moisture into fields and to get protection from crops from the wind to do better and to enhance the yields. And uh, we also see shelter belts around people's yards. People want to have a higher quality of life behind the shelter belt. They can plant their uh, apple, their cherry, their uh, other bushes of, of fruits and other things that make the quality of their life better. With a shelter belt, you get the protection from the wind about uh, 10 to 12 times uh, downwind the highest tree that you have. So if you have a 100 uh, foot tree, you might get uh, protection from the wind 1,000 feet, uh, 1,200 feet down, uh, downwind. Shelter belts have changed a lot. When the first uh, Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration uh, program came out and started giving away uh, trees on the prairies for shelter belts, it was to preserve soil and to uh, improve uh, farming during uh, the dust bowl of, of, of that period of time to stop the soil from eroding and, and uh, blowing away. So the reason that those were planted it was often like a two row shelter belt, uh, might have been a, a spruce, all spruce, uh, might have been quite simple in terms of its needs uh, and, and in what it hoped to achieve and might have been largely monocropped because of simplicity. But we've got a lot more growing technology available today. We have logistics that allow us to ship and get seeds from different areas and we've tried a lot of different uh, types of things that are possible. So now what we're seeing is there are less large uh, field shelter belts uh, like the grandfathers used to have because, well, there's 100 foot wide combines and shelter belts can sometimes get in the way. Although we still think that they're a worthwhile investment during times of drought or, or more uh, natural type uh, approaches to growing. However, uh, the biggest growth that we see in shelter belts is all with the smaller acreage owner around a major center. And uh, that means that people want more fruits and berries. They want more diversity. They don't have the space to have a 100 foot uh, line of trees and they might also want not straight lines they might want uh, a weave and a curve and an S and they might have a bit of a, a hill on their property that they want to take into effect or a bit of a wetland that they want to take into account with the design of their shelter belt so that kind of flexibility and the increased diversity is definitely at odds with where shelter belts started out of a lot of simplicity and for the soil erosion needs the first step in starting a shelter belt is always to know your land. We actually encourage our customers to go onto Google Maps, print out a map of their space, find their orientation, know which direction the wind is coming from. Although on the majority of the prairies, the wind is predominantly coming from the north and west, there are many areas where, for whatever reason, the wind tends to dominate from the west or from the southwest uh, uh, or from the north. So, and occasionally if you're in the you know, like Pincher Creek or, or Foothills areas, sometimes it comes from straight above and that's challenging. So we suggest that people get the lay of their land and that they start mapping it out because you're going to need to incorporate the spacing for multiple rows of trees to get the maximum benefit from your shelter belt. Spacing is key and that will help you with your selection and also knowing your land. Uh, that's the biggest unknown equation. A lot of people call us and they don't really know their land and they're like, I don't know how much you know, moisture I have. I don't know about that wet spot. Nothing's growing over there and never has, not even weeds. There must be something wrong over there. So they get to look a little closer and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna have some challenges there. How do you suggest that we do it? So beginning planning is, you know, there's so much of the success of a good shelter belt. We suggest you plan. The direction, prevailing direction of the wind and the land, uh, those are all important, but Additionally, you want to think about the amount of moisture and uh, rainfall that you get on the property, uh, the types of soils you have and if they're prepared for the planting, and also how you might uh, water the, uh, the plants for establishment or even make sure that you're mulching the, the plants to get better establishment. And you also want to think about the proximity to your property line. In some places, you can't plant right up to the property line. The county's going to come uh, or the uh, RM's going to come and talk to you. 
and uh, that, that avoid the problems in advance. Additionally, if you have some uh, interaction with your neighbors, it's a good idea to be proactive and talk to them about your plans up front. Nothing's worse uh, than, than planting a, a couple of rows of something and realizing they intend to, uh, to spray Roundup or something on a regular basis, and that might impact what you're trying to do. So with a little bit of extra space, you can end up uh, having a good uh, conversation with your neighbor and good feelings and a successful project. So once you got those basic building blocks of a shelter belt on your plan uh, in place, you want to start thinking about your other needs. Some people actually plan to shelter belt and plan for some small amounts of firewood to be produced or small amounts of branches to be used for for mulches around their property. Some of them want uh, the first row, they want fruits and berries and they want them for the wildlife. Sometimes uh, people are birders and they want to have more grouse on their property. And with the right mix of trees and shrubs, you can, uh, you can get those things to occur. Also, lilacs, you know, it's very standard to plant a row of velosa lilac in your front row, but you could just as easily alternate common purple lilac and velosa lilac, and guess what? Velosa lilac is also known as the late lilac with flowering about 10 days after the common purple lilac. So if you alternate them, one, two, one, two, you will, uh, it, it looks like it's in bloom for uh, almost two or three weeks. And it can be very attractive, a lot nicer scent, etc. And that increases your quality of life, which ultimately, it, if, if the shelter belt's just utilitarian for you and it's just serving that one function, great. But often it serves multiple functions. Try to think them through and you can get a lot more out of your shelter belt. A lot of people will use a shelter belt in an area that has a bit of a riparian zone. And it's important to make sure that you're planting riparian zone uh, appropriate species in those areas. And then once you're further away from the water, then you can start more of a, a taller shelter belt. The other thing to keep in mind is shelter belts, especially when they're young, do not mix well with livestock. On the other hand, uh, shelter belts can also be used to protect your livestock and, and uh, help them have some grazing available to them if if you design it appropriately. So the extra protection from the wind, we all know the cows put their butt into the, the heavy winds when, when, when they come and winter storms, etc. Well, guess what? If you have a shelter belt, guess where the, the cows go and they don't have to put their butt into the wind. So there are a lot of reasons to think about the needs of your shelter belt up front. I tell people that a shelter belt is really designed and was created to mimic mother nature. The first row of the shelter belt, the one that's uh, uh, on the outlying edge towards the north and the west where the prevailing winds are, you typically want to have a first row of a, a fast growing shrub. And that would be typically a carragana, a, a lilac, a, uh, a common purple lilac or a velosa lilac, or it might even be, if you're in a wetter area, red osier dogwood. Silver buffalo berry is a very strong choice and it attracts wildlife and small woodland creatures will go get seek protection under there. Sea buckthorn you might plant in that row. Uh, you can also plant uh, Saskatoon berries and uh, Siberian crab apple in, on those areas. You do have to think, however, about uh, what kind of wildlife are you attracting? Is it one that you want to attract? Uh, do you have bears in your area? Maybe you don't want to attract that because your home is just on the other side of it. So keep those things in mind. Uh, the second row is uh, is kind of, so it, on the prairies, you're never going to see a large uh, conifer growing singly on its own. And if you do, it gets pushed over by wind pretty quickly. Trees kind of create a buddy system. And that first row is the shrub row that we just talked about. The second row is a fast growing poplar, willow, or maple, and occasionally a bur oak or a green ash. And uh, they work buddy system to slow down the wind and push it up. And the first row of shrubs actually uh, allows you to collect more moisture from the snow and allow the second row to get established. So they each work, work together and they are uh, intermingled and you're working with mother nature instead of against her. So uh, the first row is the shrub row. The second row would be fast growing hybrid poplar, uh, different types of willows. We have a lot of willows that are well suited to, to it with uh, laurel leaf willow, acute leaf willow, golden willow, silver leaf willow. We also have uh, a lot of people will try other different varieties in there. Uh, fast growing maples like a Manitoba maple. Uh, we've seen people try to plant different types of maples. We've even seen people put Ammer maple in the first row because they wanted the gorgeous red fall color that an Ammer, uh, Ammer maple gets. Additionally, on the second row, we sometimes get a lot of green ash or bur oak, which are uh, you're capable of growing. They are a little bit smaller, slower growing than some of the others, so you have to be patient. And, and uh, but that's often not an issue for the enhanced beauty and uh, needs that are filled by those trees. Additionally, uh, the third row is often a uh, conifer of some sort. It would be a, a white spruce, a Colorado spruce, maybe a Siberian larch, maybe. 
uh, a Scots pine or, or something similar like that. What this does is it further slows down the wind. If you are in a uh, very flat area and you have a lot of land, you might want to have five rows on your north and on your west side around your house. And you might be able to uh, get away with only three rows on the south and the east. So if you're gonna double up the rows, you typically wanna double up the fast growing poplar willow maple row and the conifer type row. That's typically what you do if you wanted to expand upon it. In some areas, you're gonna benefit from the nearby environment. Maybe your neighbors have, uh, across, or maybe across the street, there's a small forest belt and the wind has already slowed down. So you don't need five rows, you probably only need two or three. And you can adjust the shelter belt to your size and, and, and you should to, for your needs. One of the most common things that we see as a new thing that didn't really occur a lot in uh, your grandfather's shelter belt is, and we are seeing a lot more with uh, smaller acreage owners, is the need for diversity. Lots of people want more pollinators around because they're planting gardens and they want it to be a, a Garden of Eden on the prairies or a, a little oasis, and that is possible. Uh, and the key to a lot of that is diversity. So. Uh, there tends to be slightly higher plantings with uh, eco belts or some of these other approaches and it's diversity and a lot more understory, uh, mid-story and upper story type trees. So the shrub row isn't just for the shrub zone and you might plant uh, raspberries in there and buffalo berry and uh, because buffalo berry, uh, silver buffalo berry does well with the uh, with drier, uh, drier type areas and then you might try some things in a wetter area, you might try a little bit wetter type plants as well. So the diversity takes a little bit more planning and a little bit more work, but if you're willing to do that, you truly can have a Garden of Eden. And uh, it's very hard to change some of these things after the fact if you just put in the, your grandfather's shelter belt and stuck with the, the three or four traditional trees like a Carragana row, a hybrid poplar row, and a, and a white spruce row. Uh, that is very, uh, you know, vanilla, uh, plain, plain type uh, standard uh, shelter belt type thing. And we see people want a lot more choice. They want to express themselves more. They will try growing things that are on the edge of zone hardiness, just on the, the final rows of their shelter belt or even within their shelter belt to experiment. Why? Because on the prairies, we're all about innovation and trying new things. And part of that journey of discovery and adventure uh, on the land can be brought back. You can be excited to go for a walk with your dog on the shelter belt and check it out and see how your Northern Red Oak is actually surviving on the prairies when you weren't sure it would. So when we're talking about uh, some of these extra biodiversity type aspects of a shelter belt, you want to think a lot about when is the nectar and the pollen available from each of the species, uh, species I'm planting. You know, if you're monocropping and you're planting all like uh, wheat or canola or, some, or corn or something like that, those bees and, and other pollinators will do really strongly when they're blooming and have pollen available. But when they don't, they'll fall back typically to your shelter belt. That's where the greatest uh, diversity is and they're, they're gonna try to find other things there to support their populations. So if you have more shelter belts, you'll have better biodiversity. You'll actually have better yields within a certain distance from your shelter belt. Uh, the research is very clear on a bunch of that. And then it also attracts birds and other things that eat those bugs and then have droppings that also further benefit your crop. There are a bunch of generalizations on, on the spacing of planting. So generally what you would do is you do a 15 foot row for between 15 feet between uh, the shrub row and the fast growing willow poplar or maple. And then you do a 20 foot uh, spacing between that deciduous type row and the conifer type row. And that, those are pretty typical type measurement differences and spacing. Conifers uh, tend to not grow quite as wide as the deciduous. That's the reason for the extra five feet. Um, and you know, those things are, are old recipes and they can be experimented with, but there's a reason that they were the original recipe. It, it's tried, it's true. If you go too far different than that, you probably want to know why you're doing it. Um, and it is some experimentation. I suggest you talk to other resources in your area. Your, uh, the local people at your RM sometimes have experience doing shelter belts. Your neighbors probably have experience. If you have a nearby county, you might have experience uh, with the Ag, Ag Service Board or watershed districts in Manitoba have uh, people that have skills uh, planting shelter belts. And they often have the other resources, two person tree planters if you're planting a long row and plastic mulchers and plastic mulch applicators that help you uh, with extra success on your project. Compaction is probably one of the biggest things that we see as a 
barrier to the successful establishment of and consistent establishment of shelter belt trees. Often if you had a uh, paddock where there were a lot of heavy livestock uh, and you didn't till the ground deeply, you will notice that the soil texture underneath is not nearly as good and it takes a long time to restore that. The trees no notice that as well. Trees kind of, it's for them, it's like growing through a uh, concrete uh, slab. Uh, they don't have the nice porous material. They have to do a lot of extra work to go through it. Guess what? The tree height in those areas is going to be smaller. So if you planted, uh, if you stored some uh, heavier machinery on that spot for a while, you need to do a deeper type of uh, tilling of the soil, ripping up of the soil, some uh, moving of the soil to get the soil texture back where it's holding uh, oxygen and moisture in a much more effective way to reestablish those trees. Compaction and competition are two of the worst killers of trees that exist. Weeds can be terrible. Set yourself up for success. Use a plastic mulch to get established or an organic mulch to get established. These things will allow you to, when properly applied, and a lot of people don't apply mulches properly. Uh, we see a lot of people that uh, uh, want to spread around a one inch uh, circle of mulch and that's not really going to keep the weeds down and it's not really going to keep in a lot of moisture and in my experience leads to extra problems where people turn it into the soil and it tends to rob the soil of some nitrogen uh, and cause some other problems. It is better to make sure you've got your four or five inches uh, all the way across uh, and maybe four, four feet on every side around the trees that you're planting. There are some people that can get away with three feet. Six feet is uh, probably is not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, set yourself up for success. These are these are the ways to be successful. The other thing to think about is when the trees are young, sometimes if you're in a dry area, they might need some help to find water the first couple of years. How are you going to do that? Uh, some people set up sprinklers, some people bring in water trucks. Uh, the mulch can really help uh, uh, make every time it rains last a lot longer and uh, make your needs to water the trees a lot less. If I had some major takeaways from what I'm trying to tell you, it would be plan. Take the time to learn the trees. We're in a, in a time and era where plant blindness is a real thing. You know, 90% uh, of the population in some areas cannot identify any of the trees on their street. You don't want to be that person if you're planting a shelter belt. It's your land. You're the steward. You need to know. You make the right decisions. If you're rushing the decision, you might not be making the right decision. And it could cost you. And you won't be as happy or in, and enjoying it or as engaged with your land as you can and should be. Do the work up front. It's worth it.